The principles of genetics teach us that we are related profoundly to the things that have made us. In a sense, you belong to what created you. You are owned, not as property, for such a legal word is too mundane a thing to describe phenomenal life. Yet we are owned in some kind of metaphysical sense by that from which we proceed. That which my genes produce, body, skin, organs, all belong to me. They are my body, my skin, and my organs. If I pass on my genes to a child, that child also, in a sense, belongs to me. He or she is not simply a child, but my child. And in a sense, I belong to my children. I cannot be a parent abstractly without being their parent concretely. The relationship may be different, for there are many different ways to belong and to be claimed. But we belong nonetheless, for the same material is in us both. And beyond genetics, there is spirit, there is will and work and nurturing and training, loyalty and responsibility, all of which have cultivated us like gardens into being. There is no such thing as a self-made person. We are indeed beings that are made, coming into existence in steps, growing and maturing, but we do not make ourselves. We are made by others. Of course, we are agents who can act and choose, but we can act only with what we are given, and we can choose only in the unique matrix of special possibilities that is different for each of us. We are individuals, and we are not individuals. No one chooses to be born. You exist not because of you or your own choice, but because of someone else's. Your very name was given to you by someone else. You may change it, but you cannot change before another has already formed you. You cannot change the genes that you are given. Not yet. But even if someday we can, we cannot change the past from which we proceed, and to which we belong with dreadful force. For anyone who feels the givenness of things, who feels that their life is a thing given them, that you come from somewhere, somewhere outside yourself, that you are not necessary or inevitable, that you are dependent in your whole being on the quote, other. If you feel this, you feel at the very least a sense of gratitude. For when you are given a gift, there's always a sense of reciprocity attached. You are thankful and you feel that you should reciprocate. This is intuitive. At the most, you have a sense of profound union with the thing that has made you, a oneness. There is a genetic relationship between you and the other thing. You are related. The same material, so to speak, is in both. And from this oneness comes a sense of pride, love, and allegiance. The word patriotism comes from the Greek word patris, the word for country, which grows from the same etymological tree as the word pater, the word for father. Patris is your fatherland, and the idea of your country is conceptually identical with the father that begets you, creates you. You are made by your country. Your land and its way of life is in you, and you in it. In patriotism is an awareness of how your land has created you. Patriotism is not about flag-waving and chanting or political involvement. It is first and foremost about a lively sense of the meaningfulness and value of the things around you, and your identity with them. Before we even talk about pride in our country or loyalty to our country, we have to be aware of ourselves and how our country has made us. Friedrich Nietzsche writes that this awareness of where we have come from, what he rather dully calls antiquarian history, gives us a sense of union with the things around us, causing us to transcend ourselves and find meaning in life that goes far beyond our own lives. History, he says, thus belongs in the second place to him who preserves and reveres, to him who looks back to whence he has come, to where he came into being, with love and loyalty. With this piety, he as it were gives thanks for his existence. By tending with care that which has existed from of old, he wants to preserve for those who shall come into existence after him the conditions under which he himself came into existence, and thus he serves life. The possession of ancestral goods changes its meaning in such a soul. They 
possess it. The trivial, circumscribed, decaying, and obsolete acquire their own dignity and inviolability through the fact that the preserving and revering soul of the antiquarian man has emigrated into them and there made its home. The history of his city becomes for him the history of himself. He reads its walls, its towered gate, its rules and regulations, its holidays, like an illumined diary of his youth. And in all this, he finds again himself, his force, his industry, his joy, his judgment, his folly and vices. Here we lived, he says to himself, for here we are living, and here we shall live, for we are tough and not to be ruined overnight. Thus, with the aid of this we, he looks beyond his own individual transitory existence and feels himself to be the spirit of his house, his race, his city. Sometimes he even greets the soul of his nation across the long, dark centuries of confusion as his own soul. The reality for most of us is that we must live somewhat banal lives. Most of us will not be the great men and women who formed history like we talked about in the previous essay. We will not be a great Caesar or an Alexander, nor a Socrates, nor a Leonardo. We will not be adventurers or warriors. No songs will be sung of us. We will not draw the tide of men into our hands and write our will across the stars. Instead, we will have to be a Walter Mitty. We will have to work our uninteresting jobs, live in our dull apartments in our cookie cutter neighborhoods, and be very much like the not so interesting crowd all around us. If we are to have a sense of weighty significance, if we are to transcend our individuality and feel that these forgettable lives of ours nevertheless have a significance beyond themselves, we must draw from the history of the places that we live. Nietzsche goes on, but this antiquarian sense of veneration of the past is of the greatest value when it spreads a simple feeling of pleasure and contentment over the modest, rude, even wretched conditions in which a man or nation lives. Niebuhr, for example, admits with honorable candor that on moor and heathland among free peasants who possess a history, he can live contented and never feel the want of art. How could history serve life better than when it makes the less favored generations and peoples contented with their own homeland and its customs, and restrains them from roving abroad in search of something they think more worth having and engaging in battles for it? Without this sense of our past, without a veneration for it, we succumb, says Nietzsche, to desires for expeditions and adventures. A nation that ceases to be faithful to its own origins is given over to a restless cosmopolitan hunting after new and ever newer things. And this is precisely the condition of the modern West. Discontented with our homes, we long continuously like a Quixote, or what is more telling, like a Disney protagonist, for far-off adventure. Indeed, whole generations have been trained by Disney to be discontented with their home, which, for what it is worth, must surely have been the opposite of Walt Disney's vision for life. It is no coincidence that his Magic Kingdom theme park is profoundly American and profoundly in love with America. And it is precisely this kind of reverence for our own past that yields the contentment of the tree in its roots, the happiness of knowing that one is not wholly accidental and arbitrary, but grown out of a past as its heir, flower and fruit, and that one's existence is thus excused, and indeed, justified. Antiquarian history preserves us, not as a dead animal is preserved in taxidermy, but as a green leaf is preserved by its connection to the stem, and branch, and trunk, and roots, and soil, down to the land. In the same way, we are preserved by a sense of connection with the things around us. If we are connected to our own unique three-dimensional place in space, and if the things that we see around us that we feel and touch and interact with, if they are alive with an elder vitality, then we remain evergreen and life never wearies us. But without a sense of where we come from and what has made us, if we do not feel our DNA in the things around us, if we do not feel how far back our own genes stretch, and we do not feel how ancient and great the spirit within us is, 
then we begin to wither and fade, and life becomes boring and burdensome. So I will repeat what I said before. We must learn our history. The history of our cities must become for us the history of ourselves. Her rules and laws and holidays must be a diary to us where we find ourselves, our force, our industry, our joy, our judgment, our folly, and vices. We look beyond the horizon of our own individual transitory existence and feel ourselves to be the spirit of our houses, our people, our city. Well, thank you so much for watching this video to the very end. I hope it will encourage you to go crack open a book on history or do some internet research on the history of where you are, where you come from. Maybe go talk to someone who knows your history. I think it's really, really important that people start to fall more and more in love with where they are from. Of course, that doesn't mean that we don't criticize the places where we are from or the people around us or that we never criticize our nations and our countries. And that is what our next video is going to be about, Nietzsche's third use for history, the critical use. If you're interested in that, hit the subscribe button. Hopefully it'll be out in a little while. If you like this video, you want to help promote it, hit the like button. And by all means, let me know what your thoughts are in the comments. Would you say that you live in a very patriotic place? Do you think that's a good thing or do you think that's a bad thing? Is patriotism something we should talk about more? Food for thought. Till we talk again.